Hello, and welcome to this second study from the book of Philippians. We introduced this uh, study last week and presented it under the title of Think Like Jesus. It is in this book of Philippians, I think, that we do learn about thinking like Jesus. And as today, we really do get into the text. I mean, we started with the first two verses, those introductory verses of chapter 1 last week. Now we're looking at verses 3 through 11 of chapter 1. And Paul is going to introduce some ideas that are going to become much more evident in the book. And I think also that we get our first taste of what it means to think like Jesus as he begins to clarify and emphasize his relationship with the Philippians. Now, this isn't all just niceties that Paul is dealing with here. This this really does begin to get to the heart of things, and we see demonstrated in Paul's words uh, how he is thinking like Jesus, and therefore then how we can learn to better think like Jesus. So as we uh, as we think about that uh, today, <clears throat> let's begin by reading the text of Philippians chapter one verses three through eleven. Now before I do that, I, I want to mention again we have these scripture journal books available. And many folks picked those up last Sunday, and they will be available again following services this coming Sunday. And just grab, grab one of those as you leave on Sunday or stop by the building, the church building, the church office, and you can pick up a copy there. I, I think you might find these to be very helpful. I also want to mention before we read our text that we have our study sheet available you can access that online on the Facebook page, the church's Facebook page. It will be there in a post, uh, one just prior to this video having been posted. So you, you might want to take a look at that. I have some introductory comments in that. Also some questions from the text that just try to get us into that text a little bit. And then some questions to think about, some questions to ponder. Uh, what are things that we ought to be thinking about uh, in terms of the, the ideas that are presented here? So let's go ahead and let's start reading Philippians 1, starting in verse 3. Paul writes, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for all for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the praise and the glory of God. So, Immediately, Paul expresses very clearly his relationship with the church at Philippi, with the Christians at church uh, at Philippi. He he emphasizes and clarifies that relationship, and and most definitely, it is one of great love and affection from Paul uh, as he speaks about these people. Uh, right off the bat, he says that when he thinks about them, uh, he is thankful. I thank my God on, on every remembrance of you. Not only does that is that the case, but he also is joyful as he prays about them. 
Uh, that's, that's such a marvelous thing that Paul has that kind of a relationship with these people that it brings, it stirs within him, it elicits from him thankfulness and joy. But he goes on and he makes that statement, uh, I hold you in my heart. Uh, wow, that, that's, a, that's a pretty impressive thing. Uh, we get the idea that it's not, you know, Paul, every once in a while, he has this fleeting thought about the Philippians, but they are ones who are constantly uh, in his heart and on his mind. Uh, he says that I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul has this longing. That's, that's kind of what's behind that word yearn. I'm, I'm longing for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. So his, he, he is very, uh, very bold. He's very blatant in his statement of his love and affection for the Philippian Christians. And that is a, a love and affection as we think about this text, and as we study this text, that is informed and educated by Jesus Christ and by what Christ has done and thus by the gospel itself. Now, it is um, it interesting that, that in making this great statement of his feelings about the Philippians, he doesn't leave it just in the realm of his feelings about them because he's taken action in regard to them as well. He has, he has prayed for them. He actually uses the term uh, that some of your translations will read supplication. Uh, there's, there's prayer mentioned three times here in these verses, twice in verse 4 and then the final time in verse 9. Now, the, the occurrence in verse 9 is a different word. The two words in verse 4 are this idea of supplication. That is making request when Paul prays for the Philippians. It's not in just that very vague sense of, well, I've, I'll be praying for you, or I've been praying for you. Paul is very direct about this. Uh, he actually talks about that for which he does pray for these people. He is making requests to God of them. He is very thoughtful and considerate of these people and their circumstances and their needs and that he is taking those things specifically to God. And so he is praying. He is making requests of God uh, for them and about them. And he has great confidence in this. That's the, the language he uses in verse 6. And he says, I am I'm sure of this. The, these are things about which I have assurance and confidence in and that he says, it is right for me to feel this way about you. So he, he, does, he does clarify and emphasize this relationship that he has with the Philippians. Now, I want you to notice something with me. Uh, and that is that Paul kind of sets this whole thing up in, in a time frame. Notice where he talks about in verse 5, from the first day until now, and then he speaks of the day of Jesus Christ. And he mentions that twice, uh, first of all in the end of verse 6 and then also in verse 10. So you have from the first day until now, and then from now until the day of Jesus Christ. So we have two, two, t excuse me, we have three time frames that Paul is dealing with here. We have the past from the first day until now. And we have the present, which of course is now. And then we have the future, which is from now until the day of Christ. And in regard to each of those, Paul has something to say about himself and the Philippians. In regard to the past, he says that I am thankful. I am thankful upon every remembrance of you. Uh, regarding the present, he says, I yearn for you. Uh, and then regarding the future, he says, I pray this for you. 
And so all three time frames, there's something very specifically uh, that Paul is doing or feeling or experiencing in regard to the Philippians. And, and not only that, though, there is reason for this in each of those time frames. In the past, from the first day until now. And I think we should understand that phrase, the first day, from uh, the day the gospel came to the city of Philippi, the day they responded to the gospel, the, from the, the time he originally was with them in the city of Philippi. From that day until now, he says, I'm thankful. I am thankful because of your partnership in the gospel. These are people who had supported and encouraged Paul in the preaching of the gospel from the very beginning. As you trace the movements of Paul after he leaves Philippi, not only in the book of Acts, but comments that he makes uh, in other letters, and then some things he's going to say later in this letter, that's going to come in chapter 4, he's going to He's going to mention to them how they have supported him continually from the very beginning and provided for his needs as he was preaching the gospels. They had a partnership with Paul in the preaching of the gospel. And so he is thankful to God for them and what they have meant to him in the past. But now he says, I yearn for you. In the present, I am yearning for you. I am longing for you. And the reason he says he is doing that is because they, uh, they are all partakers with me of grace. And that's in verse 7. It's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace. They are ones who have continued to affiliate themselves and associate themselves with Paul very actively in doing that. He says, in my imprisonment, which that's presently Paul's case, he is in prison, and they have reached out to Paul there. Uh, we mentioned this last week. They sent one of their own. Uh, some see Epaphroditus as being the preacher at Philippi. And they sent him to see Paul in his imprisonment and to deliver to him uh, this support and monetary gift and, and, and what other ways they were able to provide support for him while he is in prison. And so both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Interesting that Paul characterizes the work that he's doing and the participation or partaking of the Philippians with him in that work in the defense of the gospel. Uh, and we're going to talk more about this as we move on into our study, that uh, the gospel in the ears of many people didn't sound right. Uh, it was a message that, that needed defense, and Paul willingly and effectively provided that defense. Not only that, but in the confirmation confirmation of the gospel, in the affirming of the reality of the gospel that is based, of course, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says, I, I yearn for you for this participation or this partnership, or rather partakers, uh, that you're partakers with me in grace as you have um, been with me in, in spirit and in support and encouragement in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. So that's present. I yearn for you. And then future. Uh, future, Paul has a prayer for them. He has a prayer for them, and it regards the fact of their being completed by God, God has begun a work in you that I am confident that he is going to complete that work in you. And so as Paul prays for them, he prays that they will be completed by God. And I think this is a very important part of this text and one that certainly we can draw a lot of personal application uh, from 
Uh, and that is this idea of being completed in Christ. And as we look here in a few moments about his praying for them and what's going to happen to them uh, in the future, uh, that is God working in them and through them and with them, uh, we'll look more specifically at what the, the content of that prayer actually was. And so Paul uh, has this time frame, past, present, future. And he has things to say that are relevant to each of those time frames. So now we, we continue then, um, after having noted that, we, we want to go back and think just a little bit about what the Philippians were, what they are, and what they will be. Uh, that's a good way for us to look even at ourselves, what we were, what we are, and what we will be. Now, in, in this part of the letter, when you think about what the Philippians were, he, he's not talking about what they were prior to their becoming Christians. He's talking about what they were since having become Christians from that time, from the first day until now. And then what they are, presently, and then what they will be. I think one of the, the great lessons that we need to learn is that it's easy for us to become settled in our spirituality and, and, and settled in our faith and religious life in the sense that we feel like, okay, I became a Christian, I'm done. And so now I'm just kind of coasting along until I die or the Lord comes back, and that's basically all there is to it. But certainly Paul didn't see things that way. He, he saw what they were, and he's thankful for what they were because what they were was what Paul needed, and it was what they needed to be. And it was that which advanced the kingdom of God, their, their participation in the gospel. And so we can look at what we were from the time we became a child of God until the present moment in time. And hopefully we're able to see that we have been like the Philippians in that, that we could participate uh, in the gospel and do what we can in the advancement of the kingdom. What they are, are, are partakers of grace. As Paul is in very difficult circumstances, they willingly stand with Paul and beside Paul, and they encourage him and they support him. And as such, they are partakers of grace. And that's a, that is a good thought, I believe, to maintain uh, in regard to ourselves, is that we are, we are partaking in the grace of God. Paul, Paul would write to the Romans and say, I am what I am by the grace of God. And I hope that very thought and that very realization is burned in within all of us. That is always a present realization that we have, that we are what we are because of the grace of God, not because of our abilities, not because of our talents, not because our diligence and devotion or any of those things, although all of those things are good and appropriate and right. We are what we are by the grace of God. And that was something that Paul found in the Philippians to be something very desirous and very pleasant and very good. I yearn, I yearn for you. you I hold you in my heart with the affection of Christ Jesus. I want to say something about that phrase here because you may be reading from a translation like the King James Version that, that talks about the bowels of Christ. And that, that's very interesting. That's a very literal rendering of the term that is used uh, in the original language. But it's not used literally. It is used metaphorically. It is used figuratively. Uh, as, as one commentator said, it is emotion at the gut level. It's not 
superfluous. It's not fleeting. It's not surface. But it is at the very core and the heart. Uh, it is that which comes from deep within us, we would say. Uh, and so a literal term is used to describe that, the bowels, the, the, work, the, uh, the vital organs of our insides. Uh, but this affection, uh, it, it, it comes from deep within us, and it is centered in, in Christ. It is centered in Jesus. So what the Philippians were, what they are, and what they will be. Uh, they're going to be completed by God. Now, it is at that point that I, I want us to continue on here, and I want us to think a little further about this, because he has some things very specific to say about their being completed. It is my prayer, this is in verse 9, uh, Paul is praying for them in regard to what's going to happen to them in the future. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. When you think of what one person could pray on behalf of another person, in this instance, what Paul could pray on behalf of the Christians at Philippi, the first thing that he, he thinks about and the first thing that he says is, I pray that your love would grow, that you would be more loving. He's not suggesting that they weren't loving people and that love was not the motivation and the, and the undergirding of all that they're doing and their relationship with God. But it is of such great significance that he, he says, my prayer is, that your love may abound. Um, that's more than than simply grow. That it would bound. It would overflow. It would exceed what is presently true, or what might even be anticipated. That your love would abound. But he doesn't stop there, does he? That he said that your love would abound more. That that even though it, it might might abound, that it would even do so more. And more. I mean, Paul is, is, is pouring it on here, isn't he? Which, which tells us that, that no matter how much love may be in us and how much we may love others and how much love may be a part of our life, it can be more and it should be more. And that's what Paul is wanting for the Philippians, that, that, that your love would abound more and more. But notice he doesn't even stop there. He says, with all discernment and knowledge. Now this, this is pretty important because it's not pretty important. It's very important. We think about love as an emotion, as a feeling. But we know also that the love that we are, that, that Scripture so often talks about, this agape love, is one that is based not necessarily on feeling, but it is based upon uh, an action that that proceeds with the best interest of the one who is loved in mind. Now, what he says that that it is going to abound more and more with all knowledge and discernment, with all understanding. Love is not purely emotional. Love is informed, and love is educated. It, it, th this has been described as love is this mighty river, but this mighty river has banks. Uh, you know, uh, a, a river that gets outside of its banks becomes very destructive. There, when it gets out of its banks, it the, there is a lot more water there than is normal. And Paul is talking about, okay, you have love, and I want that to abound more and more. I want a lot more of it to be there. But it needs to be with all knowledge and discernment. And that knowledge and discernment, of course, uh, Peter, at the end of Second Peter, says... Um, 
that his prayer and his desire for those to whom he writes is that they would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we are ever to be growing in our knowledge and our understanding. Um, in First Peter chapter 1, uh, what are often called the Christian graces, uh, that we are to, that knowledge is a part of that. And if these things are in you and increasing, he says. And so we're ever trying to grow in our knowledge of God because as we grow, we grow in our understanding and knowledge. We're going to grow. In our, the more we know about God, and when the more we know about Jesus and what He's done for us, and those for whom He has done it, done it, then our love can't help but grow, abound. So, with all knowledge and discernment, discernment is this this understanding, this able to this ability to discern or decide. Uh, to recognize what is of great worth and what is of the greatest worth. Uh, and we're, hang on to that thought for just a second. So the first thing is here is, is that your love may abound, that you may, secondly, approve what is excellent. So what you're going to be interested in and concerned for is what is excellent. We're interested in what is good and what is right, and what is appropriate, and what is acceptable, and all of those kinds of things. But he says, you, you're going to approve the things that are truly excellent. Excellence is going to be of concern to you, and that's going to be the ideal for which you are uh, striving and pursuing. And, and what a what a great message for us when we look at our lives and how we go about living them and the things for which we are concerned and the things that we give our attention to, uh, the, the things that we fill our lives with. Are they really the things that are excellent? Are we approving the things that are excellent? Are we... Or are we just satisfied with what's good enough? I, I believe it's Stephen Covey who is attributed with having said the the enemy of the best is the good. The enemy, for our purposes, the enemy of the excellent is the good. Well, we, we get to what is good and we say, aha, that, that's it. And we should want what's good. But he says you're going to approve what is excellent. And then as you approve what is excellent, that you be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. We think about the day of Christ. We think about the day of Christ's coming. We think about the day of judgment. And we want to be able to stand in that day pure and blameless. Now, I think we need to think about this two ways. One is in light of what we've just said, that, that we are going to approve the things that are excellent. And if we do that in our lives, if we make that our, our, our habit of approving what is excellent, then we're, we're going to steer clear of the things that are impure, aren't we? We're going to stay away from the things that would defile us we're going to stay away from the things that if we associated with them or engaged in them, then blame could be attached to us. We're approving excellent things and therefore being pure and being blameless becomes a much greater likelihood in our lives, does it not? Now, let, let me say this. And that is, we are not going to achieve purity and blamelessness on our own. I, I cannot be good enough. I cannot be pure enough. I am not blameless. I, I'm guilty of sin. I'm guilty of wrong. I, we all have faults and failings. 
And so there is this other sense in which we need to think about being able to be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. There is only one who has ever been pure and blameless, and that, of course, is Christ Jesus. And it's going to be in him that we're going to find the purity and the blamelessness. Uh, we go back up to the initial verses that open this letter, and you remember it's addressed to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Well, purity and blamelessness are found in Christ Jesus, and so we must be in him. Uh, but okay, Paul's prayer. I'm praying that your love would abound. This is this is God's work being completed in us. Uh, love is abounding. We are approving the things that are excellent, that we might be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. And then we add to that finally that we would be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Now, anytime we think of, of fruit, I think, I think we do anyway. <laughs> uh, we think of Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit, those things that that uh, become characteristic of our lives because of God's Spirit in us. And as we are approving the things that are excellent, uh, we are pursuing righteousness, are we not? And as we are pursuing righteousness, then the fruit of righteousness is going to be produced within us what God wants to see in us is, is not just that we think the right things and we believe the right things and we practice the right things, but there actually within us is born the fruit of righteousness, which is seen in our relationship with people. Uh, how, how do we treat people and how do we think about people and how do we interact with them and deal with them? Uh, is that righteous? Is that righteousness that's evidenced in our lives? Uh, it's how we conduct ourselves. And so Paul's prayer is that the fruit of righteousness will be in us. That's, that's a, a product of or a consequence of God being at work in us. So, as that is done, he says at the very end of this statement, to the praise and the glory of God. Now, that's not just a, a throwaway statement. That's not just a, a nice sounding religious statement to kind of wrap up what he's been saying so he can move on to the next thing. That, that's what this is all about, is to the praise and the glory of of God. What was the purpose for which Christ came? It was to bring glory to God, and he brought glory to God by fulfilling God's purposes, by, by doing God's will. That glorified and praised the Father. And our lives are to be ultimately about the praise and glory of God. Well, well what accomplishes that. It's not when we can say the loudest and most frequently and the most consistently, consistently praise the Lord, but it's rather when these very things that Paul's been talking about become evident in our lives. That does praise God and bring glory to him because that is the accomplishment of God's will. God, God has a will for us and that is that our love would abound still more and more with all knowledge and discernment that we would approve the things that are excellent that the fruit of righteousness would be born in us that we would be pure and blameless in the day of Jesus Christ now I, I want to bring all of this back to what we've said is the theme for our study of the book of Philippians, and that is think like Jesus. And I think we see that evidenced in Paul's relationship with the Philippians. Paul thought like Jesus. And it was Jesus who uh, impacted and shaped and formed everything about Paul's relationship with these people. Uh, because of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. 
and their participation with Paul in that with him and being partakers of grace with Paul and being completed by God, by the work of God in their lives. Um, it, it, it is all consistent with Jesus himself about how he thought, about he how he acted, and about what he accomplished and what he desires to be true for all of us. So, uh, think like Jesus. This is to the praise and the glory of God. Well, our next study will continue on here in Philippians chapter 1. I would encourage you to read verses 12 through 18. Uh, read it once, read it twice, read it three times. Just keep reading it. Dig into this text. Let's begin to think about uh, what Paul continues to have to say to us uh, about our relationship with the Lord and how we might think like him. We hope to see you then.